On today's episode, I spoke with Katie Mitchell, a 15-year marketing pro who has led marketing teams at companies like Sprig and Everfy doing content and so much more. And in this episode, we specifically talked about the evolution of marketing the past 15 years, how content should feed into product marketing, and how to even have a successful marketing career to begin with. So we covered that and a lot more. Let's dive right into the episode. Well, well let's start kind of by introing you and giving the audience an idea of who you are and what you've done. So would love to just kind of get the bullet points on your career project, uh, you know, project trajectory and, and what's led you to what you're doing now. And then if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing a little bit of what you are up to now. Yeah, sure. I've been in SaaS and tech for something around 15 years, which makes me feel really old, <laughs> but started more um, at sales led businesses um, a long time ago when social media wasn't really a thing for professionals. So it's been really interesting to sort of see B2B marketing generally just completely change and shift over the last 10 to 15 years and sort of starting at the beginning of that uh, when it was mostly collateral and sales sheets um, to the introduction of product led growth and social and so much evolution there. Um, I have been mostly a generalist and started my career working at larger companies. I would say, sorry, growth stage companies, not larger companies, um, somewhere between 50 and 100 million um, in ARR, mostly PE backed companies. And then sort of slowly over time, worked my way to smaller companies and startups. And um, it's been an interesting evolution. I think my advice to most marketers is go to startups you know, because you will learn a lot. Um, so it was a it was a fun ride. I, I love being in, in tech and SaaS marketing because you can really like make something with your hands and ship it really quickly. Um, before I entered this world, I, I briefly had some experiences at the really large, big companies like PBS and Campbell Soup Company and and just PowerPoint hell where you just think about things and don't actually get things in the market. So um, that's sort of what led me to realizing why I love uh, this space and and really being able to make your mark quickly and get it to market and see people react. And and I've had fun doing it for the last 10 or 15 years. And and what's what's now? What are what are you working on now that kind of takes up most of your marketing hours? Yeah. So I left my last full time role um, in December of last year. Um, I live in Europe now, actually. Uh, my family moved to Copenhagen, Denmark. So I am advising and working um, with Emily Kramer of Market One, um, helping with a, a variety of things there, um, and then just helping founders and and first marketers figure out their playbook at startups right now. So that's what I'm. Awesome. Yeah, you had mentioned how you you've kind of been at this for a while, fifteen or so years. When you look back at Obviously, you you already stated some of the things that were very, very different back then with some things not existing, some things being totally different. If you look back at that time, what's something that you miss about marketing 15 years ago that isn't as common now? Oh, my gosh. Very, very little. Um, I think there was just a lot more constraints on what you could do because there weren't as many channels and there weren't as many platforms. And oh, my goodness, there was not as much tech for marketers back then. Um, so, you know, I've got horrible memories of getting lists from systems, right, that you need to get from your internal systems versus now you, you don't even need your own database to get your customer. You can go to just an external database company and um, data is so much more readily available. Um, maybe the work life felt better because there just wasn't as much to do as there is now. Um, but yeah, I say it's it's much better now. It's a why. That's Certainly that. have to be scrappier, especially the past year or so. It's it's a lot more like, hey, scrappy marketing, do a lot more with less. So that that's its own challenge, but also its own exciting thing. Um, and, and even it's kind of funny, the difference between marketing 15 years ago and 15 years or, or and now, um, there's a huge difference there. But there's also just a big difference between marketing now with startups versus big companies, like you had mentioned. Um, so when you yeah. look back at, you know, maybe the bigger companies you started with, versus startup marketing, your advice was join a startup, you'll learn more. Well, what what are what are the types of marketing that you really enjoy doing in startups that aren't as easy to do or not as common in big companies? I think the biggest difference is just there's more people in those bigger companies, right? So you have a bigger marketing team, you've got 
you know, 50 or 100 people and there's just a lot more specialization. So you might be hired to do one job and you sort of stay in your lane. Maybe you help someone out occasionally. But I think the biggest difference with startups is it really is an all hands on deck experience because you usually have at least early stage seed series A, maybe early series B. And that's sort of what I'm talking about. I mean, when you get to series D, E, then you start not really being a startup anymore, even though somehow they still call themselves startups of text. Um, but I think when you get to that really early stage company, you really get to do it all, especially as a first marketer or second or third marketer up until probably like four or five, everyone's sort of like chipping in. And I think you just get so much more exposure. I think for me, an interesting inflection point was when I realized that I hadn't, I'd always been a generalist, but I'd mostly done growth and I've done a little bit of content but more on the growth side of content. So less coming at it from like, what's the editorial or what is the story? And more just like, let's get the content out there so we can put it in our program so we can get it into the engine, right? And I think being in a startup, I mean, I had to be involved with the content because there was no one else to do it. It, Otherwise, you know, in my other companies, other people are recontracted out or whatever it was, it was done by someone else. Um, And being in that spot made me really love doing the content and creating the content and telling the story. And that was the first time that I was like, wow, I've been in marketing for a really long time, but I've actually never actually done this specific job. I've always been around it, but I've never done it. And so that's why, especially for early marketers and young marketers, I mean, that that was a lesson that I had to wait 10 years to learn. I sort of wish I had learned that 10 years ago. And so I sort of would have done my career the opposite way around where I would have gone to startups earlier and bigger companies later just to figure out like, what do I love? What do I like to do? What am I good at? Um, and, and sort of go from there. So if that's lesson learned. <laughs> totally. It's actually pretty similar. I, I started agencies, then large company, then startup, kind of similar to you. And, and I wish I could do it reverse as well. But when you're, yeah. when you're looking at, you know, piggybacking off of that idea of Large companies, you get a little bit more siloed startups. You have to sprinkle yourself across a lot of different places. When you're zoning in on something like content marketing, for example, and figuring out how that patches into all these other areas, how does, or what does it look like when content marketing and product marketing and paid ads and all these things actually come together? Like, what, what does that look like in a perfect world? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what I, I'm most excited about, um, at Sprig, where I last worked, I, um, oh, I, I started as the first marketing hire. And then over time, um, we brought in my boss, who was, was the CMO, and I started overseeing product and content marketing together. And I really think that those functions are really tied together and need really close collaboration. I think a lot of companies hire for content marketers and hire really good writers that don't necessarily know what product marketing is or how to harness it for content. And if you're at a company and you're creating content marketing, I will tell you that every single piece of content marketing you create should be product marketing content in some way, right? Because you are a company and you are selling a product. (laughs) And sure, there are certain some top of funnel, bottom of funnel, if you're talking really specifically about a use case versus you're doing thought leadership, it's going to be different. But Really from the top down, you need to really understand your audience, the use case, the product. Even if you're not talking about the product, you're trying to create awareness for a need that they might need your product, even if you're not talking about your product. And so every single piece of content, SEO content, thought leadership content, every single piece of content really has to have a like specific focus from a product marketing perspective. And I think a lot of companies sometimes miss that because content marketers tend to be really good writers first and sometimes just miss that product marketing knowledge piece. So just something when I'm talking to marketers or founders is training up those content marketers, making sure they really understand what product marketing is and what your product marketing strategy is um, to tie that into all of the content that you create across the funnel. So yeah, that's just some initial thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I, I, what came to mind when you were saying that as well is the, the example of like Ahrefs, for example, kind of notorious for doing this really, really well where content marketing is kind of their jam, but the product marketing is really strong through it because everything is just through the lens of here's a problem you're solving. Oh, and here's how this happens to play into it. Can you think of any examples at Sprig or anywhere else where you've worked where you were just really proud of how it all came together for a piece of content? 
Yeah. Um, we were doing a lot of thought leadership and because we were early in the market, um, it was a product that not a lot of, we sold the product management teams and, and not a lot of teams sort of were, had even realized they needed, they had had a problem to solve, right? So we were in sort of like making the, um, the buyer problem aware um, and, and we're doing a lot of uh, marketing and sort of creating presentations for our CEO to give at conferences um, and digital events to just make people aware, like, hey, this is a really big problem. You should be solving it. Um, and we did a lot around bringing in sort of everything we knew about the buyer and sort of how they should be approaching this sort of new, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What are the pain points? And really tying in, tying in use cases, tying in um, like really specific problems that they had in their day-to-day -day jobs that they were challenged with. And then creating a narrative around that, creating a story around that and making them say, wow, like I did, I came into this presentation and I had no idea I had a problem. And I just listened to this really interesting story from this founder. And I walked away thinking that I actually have a really big problem I need to solve. And so it was sort of that without, again, we didn't talk about Sprig. We didn't, you know, we didn't really have product screenshots as much in there. It was really just, um, the use cases and the problem and, and highlighting uh, the challenges that the buyer had. And, and that's all product marketing, right? So. With, with Sprig, was there like a contrast between at the very end when things were doing really, really well and you were, you know, as you described that things were just kind of rolling versus at the beginning, what did, what did it look like when you just started there? And what, what did the content look like at that point? And, yeah. and I guess... The greater question is what what are most companies doing that they probably should improve upon immediately? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of what they were doing when I first got there was just like your standard. And this is literally been every company I've gotten to before they've had more um, sort of as a robust content and product marketing engine. It's just like having weekly webinars, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not going to hate on your weekly webinar where you show the product and you do your sales pitch and, you know, just the, the whole thing. I, I remember vividly, vividly my first job in SAS at the company that I worked for. And my boss, who was very old school, was like, we need to have a webinar every single week. And it's a sales pitch. And we need to have a few slides of content. But then we need to ask for demos, right? Like that was like, talk about 10 years ago. Like that is it. And again, not to say that you shouldn't have webinars, but they should have a point of view and they should have like a, you know, a, a theme and they should be thought out and not just like, we're just going to host a sales pitch every week. So I think a lot of like when I was interviewing for the job at Sprig um, and I went to their webinars page and I just saw like week one, week two, week three, week four, sort of with like similar content um, and then the demo attached to it and then an opportunity to get hand racers, right? Like that's, I think, what is pretty common in SaaS, especially for beat it for uh, top down sales motions. How do, how do you think about whether it's in content or anything across marketing you've experienced? How do you think about the balance between creativity and making everything based on data? I mean, I think it has to be a balance. Um, I think that every single thing you do in marketing should be both, you should be coming at it with a creative lens and thinking about how you can um, make the most like unique, um, unique content that you could then like repurpose and use in many places. I think that's also like an, another way to answer your question, right? If you make something that's really creative and really unique, you can also leverage that in a hundred different ways and make it really efficient, right? You don't have to do something creative and unique every single day. The more creative and unique it gets, actually, the more mileage you can get out of it. And so I think um, it probably makes you even more efficient in the long run to just invest a little bit more upfront and then reuse a lot of what you create versus coming to the table every day and saying, I need to come up with something new. Wait, do it once a quarter or once a month. You, you've shared a couple of times about um, team building in, in so, or, or even just like career pro progression or, or you know, things of that nature. If you were starting a marketing team 2024, knowing everything you know, having all the tools that you have now for a B2B company, what do you think is your first hire and how do you build that team out long-term now? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's there's sort of an uh, there's sort of like a like a straightforward answer, but then there's also like an it depends, right? Because there's so many companies that have just different unique characteristics, um, whether you're product led, whether you're sales led, what's your market set, like all of those things come into play. Um, but I think overall, and, and Emily Kramer, who I work with, writes a lot about this, but you need to have a generalist that um, hasn't had too many firsts. <laughs> That's something that she likes to say a lot um, that I really agree with. Um, but you want to have someone that sort of spikes in two areas of marketing. Um, probably early on, you want someone that spikes in gross marketing and product marketing because early stage companies are trying to really hone in on that messaging and figure out what's going to resonate with the market, um, do a lot of that foundational work and also the beginning of the growth engine. And so those are two areas that I really suggest early stage companies focus on finding someone that can do both of those things um, and sort of isn't afraid to execute because early on in the startup, there's you're, you're going to need to get things out into the market, see what works and then, you know, do it again. And so those are a few of the things um, I recommend, depending on how fast your growth trajectory is and how early you're going to hire more people, having that people management experience and being able to um, really early on build the team is also important. Couple questions as we wrap up. This one is is more just specific to you and, and advice you might give somebody younger, but I'm curious if you look back at your career and the things that you think have been most successful, the things you've done that you've been most proud of, or you know, what, however you want to perceive that, what do you think is is the skill or, or the trait that is most responsible for your success as a marketer? Hi. Uh, those are hard questions for me to answer. Um, I think that the number one thing I would say is probably curiosity and just like interested in learning why and asking questions and keep prepping, right? Whether it's to a founder or a partner or my team, right? It's like, why are we doing this? What's the reason? Can we get more out of it? Just be curious, be hungry, be interested. I think something I've seen working with many different people, many different teams over the years is it's easy sometimes to just sort of phone it in and like do your job and go home. Um, the most successful people that have been on my teams and that I worked with are just always looking to make it better and always coming at it, can't coming at a problem um, from their own perspective, not trying to repeat somebody else's playbook, but saying, all the things I know, what's the best solution to this problem? And not trying to just regurgitate the playbook from their last company or a competitor, right? Um, because every company, every situation is unique. And so that's something I've always tried to do is like, no matter what company I'm at, I use frameworks to try to figure out, okay, whether it's the paid or own framework or whether it's um, some org chart framework that I really like. There's lots of different frameworks that you can use. But at the end of the day, you have to think about your unique situation, the people that you're working with, the ecosystem that your company is in and sort of the resources that you have and how to best leverage those. And so I think the creativity and sort of your own unique perspective on that and continuing to be hungry um, and ask questions is probably the number one thing that's made me and my team successful. Love it. Uh, la last question. This one is is easy. Um, what are you What are you working on now and where, where can people find you? We'd love to wrap things up. Just yeah. letting people know how to connect with you. Well, if you're really interested to connect with me in person, you should definitely take a trip to Copenhagen, Denmark. It's a wonderful place and summer now, so very beautiful. Um, but if you're not looking to go on vacation, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I have really stopped using Twitter. It was just too much for me. <laughs> um, so find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm always will willing and ready uh, to help You know, early stage companies, founders, first marketers. Um, figure out what they need to work on and help them out. So message me if that's something you're interested in and that's about it. 